Okay, and here we have one of my good mates, Scotty Goble. We've known each other for quite a few years. Thanks for coming today, Scotty, on the podcast. I do appreciate it. Um, look, some people might know much about you. Some people that have sort of followed our adventures before might, but um, mate, you've been a you've been a bodybuilder. You're a supplement shop owner. You've got a very successful uh, digital coaching business where. I have to say, I, I honestly consider you to be uh, the number one coach when it comes to IFBB bikini competitors in the country, and I'm being genuine there. You've really you've done some amazing things over the years. So, look, just very briefly, mate, can you tell us about your what? What, what are you doing in the fitness industry, mate? Is this is this a new thing for you? Have you been here forever? Uh, this is my destiny, Luke. Uh, maybe not working with bikini girls, but being in the fitness industry because I had a fascination with muscle at an incredibly young age and uh, my entire sort of educational background and everything else was uh, due to my obsession with bodybuilding from about the age of 14. So even in high school, I was picking biology and PE as my electives and uh, trying to learn as much as I could about the human body so that I could go on and study exercise physiology, which I did at university. And then the entire time I've worked within the uh, fitness industry in some capacity or another. And then inevitably I ended up being a competitive bodybuilder with, um, you know, some, some level of success in the amateur ranks in Australia. Uh, and that sort of just flowed on to a, a coaching career. Uh, it's all happened very organically just due to a, a love of the sport um, and I've somehow landed myself in a profession that didn't even exist when I started. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful for it because I, I just get to talk about bodybuilding all day long and uh, people give me money for it. So it's uh, it's worked out incredibly well. And they kind of skimmed over it, but you had some you had some good success uh, in your, your bodybuilding career. I think it was, was it four national titles that you got in the super heavyweight division? So it's not like you're I guess some uh, just complete armchair critic, like you've competed many, many times before and tested yourself against the best guys in Australia. So was it four titles? It was four titles. Are you uh, just sort of giving yourself a little compliment there where I tested myself against the best in the country and you, you want to highlight oh, yeah, your, uh, your victory? Is, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, thought, we got one for one. We got one for one. <laughs> we did get one for one. Um yeah, look, I did. I got a four open national titles, um, multiple state titles. Um, I, I did. I did try to compete against the best in the country. Like I, I competed in invitationals. It was the, the UBC, the Ultimate Bodybuilding Championships, the Elite Shows. I tried to compete in those so I could go up against the best guys and just test myself. Um, I, I didn't really at any point see myself as a. Uh, I saw myself as a potential pro. I wanted to win a pro card, but I never saw myself as having a successful pro career i think i realized the limitations of my genetics and, and towards the end of my career I, I did aspire to reach the pro ranks uh definitely but it was more just due to the credibility it would provide you i guess within the industry rather than any delusions that i was going to be a highly successful pro i felt that i just accomplished everything there was to accomplish on the amateur level it was the sort of next logical step but um fell just short of that one um but still very very grateful to have had the experience i've had and i, I try and encourage my clients now to enjoy their time in the amateur ranks because you're competing locally you're competing in front of friends and family uh there's a lot more camaraderie um whereas some people when they turn pro they they kind of just get lost like like, like you you know you're going to spend five thousand ten thousand dollars to go compete overseas um you're not competing at the same time as everyone else here in the amateur scene and people no. have sort of forgotten about you and stuff like that so um and looking back i, I think it was great that i had a, a an 11 year uh, amateur bodybuilding career and I, I did enjoy every minute of it definitely and then i mean you you've got a supplement shop and how long have you had that supplement shop now for 13 years but uh it is closing up at the end of this month so uh oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we're closing okay. the doors that the lease is up and the uh, rent was going up dramatically so if anyone wants to head down to uh sna subs and moody ponds you can probably pick up some bargains at the moment because we're trying to clear out all the stuff Oh, there you go. Well, 13 years is amazing for a supplement shop, really. I mean, that's that's incredible. But I guess, like, the, the thing is, you know, you've won national titles. You've got a supplement shop. I know you're a bodybuilding tragic. You stay on top of all the competitions and that. So how do we enter this bizarro universe where all of a sudden now you're what I consider to be the best bikini coach in the country and you've trained a number of athletes and they're bikini pros and you train athletes who are bikini pros, like, Mate, if you had said this to both of us 10 years ago, I mean, you know, we would never have imagined this ever. I thought you were going to be just 
bodybuilding world forever and just training an army of dudes competing, but it's it's almost the opposite now. How did how did we get in this situation, mate? Like honestly, where did it start? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you and I thought the both both thought the same thing. I thought that would be the evolution of my career as well, but it's turned out a little bit different. Um, it, it's a funny one because I, I don't know why I have so much success within the bikini ranks, but I, I do consistently seem to have great success in, in the bikini division. Um, a part of that is due to just the flow-on effect. of, of turn, If you turn one girl pro, uh, their reach and influence on social media does generate a lot of inquiries. Uh, whereas yeah. it, it doesn't seem like the males do the same thing because I have turned, you know, a male bodybuilder pro and Christian Corwell, a couple of male physique guys pro in um, uh, Ali Raza and uh, Dr. Ash um, up in Sydney. So much like we've um, forgotten about all, that, all of them, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I think they've gotten me between them a handful of referrals. Uh, and, and I remember uh, at one show where Jess Johnson turned pro and Mel Carver won the pro show and qualified for the Olympia, both of my, my clients at the time. I think it was early 2021. Uh, within one week, I had 100 inquiries uh, from from bikini clients wanting to coach them. I, I just I couldn't even respond as fast as they were coming in, uh, and that was that's when I became a full time online coach because I was just like, okay, uh, this is you know not not necessarily easier, but this is the ultimately the direction my career is going to go. So I stopped one on one personal training at that point in time, just became an online coach, and because. I was coaching high caliber bikini clients, uh, more high caliber uh, athletes would apply uh, for my coaching. And, and it just is a sort of ongoing self-generating uh, machine. Um, and I've been very lucky to turn four girls pro now um, and got a number of, well, three of them are active within the pro ranks. So um, yeah, I, I do believe it will continue working. And, and I like I like working with the bikini girls. I really do. It's it's incredible. I mate, like I said, I don't know how we got to this situation at all. But you know, something else that's um that has really sort of turned the page has been the idea of digital fitness coaching, online fitness coaching. I mean, I know sort of about nine years ago, uh, when we kicked off that it was it was laughable. It was like the bottom rung personal trainer. You know, you're an online coach, you're like the lowest of the low. But like now it's it's probably the most sought after type of personal training that you can possibly do. Um, are there any disadvantages to not seeing your clients in, in person and how do you overcome those disadvantages or are they really just sort of superficial disadvantages if, you, if you're able to, to make an assessment of your client based on the information they're providing, whether it's photos, measurements, their own feedback? Is there a need to see someone in person um, if they're leading into a show for a contest prep, whether it's male or female? I like seeing people in person. I do think sometimes through a conversation you can garner more information from someone than you can through, you know, written feedback or something like that. But it's by no means a necessity. And if your communication skills are good, if you're, you know, checking photos and videos are of high quality, if you've got all the data at your disposal, uh, it's not necessary at all. And I know this because I've coached people to, you know, overall wins remotely and pro cards remotely. And I've coached people to great success in international events without being able to see them in person. So it does, I guess, put a little bit more of the onus on the competitor themselves to provide the good information, like to provide the high quality check-in photos and videos and, and be able to communicate their thoughts, their feelings, their biofeedback, all that sort of stuff so I can do my job properly. Um, but if the client is up to it, then I can have every bit as much success completely online as I am face to face. Um, so yeah, I mean, you were the you one that originally convinced me. Barrier at the moment? Story. Is there still a barrier? Like, do you find that uh, someone may make an inquiry, but then they don't want to work with you because they find out you're online only, or or, or that they might only be able to work with you online, or is that now? something that's almost like a secondary consideration it's like i want to work with this coach doesn't necessarily matter if i see them in person or not i just want to work with this person yeah i, I it's very unusual that people have an issue with it these days you know i, I think it's very commonplace so i i even have people that you know live relatively locally that i coach online just because it's easy you know and, and it's easy for them as well like you know lots of people are, are busy um, and it is a very efficient way of doing business if you've got the correct systems and protocols in place. So um, it, it's very, very rarely a deterrent. Um, it, with with some local competitors, I will allow them to come in and do face to face check ins. Allow them? That sounds nice, doesn't it? But um, <laughs> they, they, they they sometimes do come in and do face to face check ins, and, and I still enjoy that style of coaching and that interaction. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, again, I, I just don't see it as a necessity because the majority of my clients are interstate, like, you know, um, so they achieve every bit as much success as my local Victorian one. So it shouldn't be an issue. And have you found that um, since you have had such success that you're getting any inquiries internationally or are we talking about just sort of Australian-based clients that you're, you're looking after at the moment? It's still the vast majority Australia based. So I've got um, some New Zealand clients. Um, had a few a, a Kaiser Kuznam uh, turned pro recently. She's a, a very big name in Estonia. Had a couple of Estonian inquiries recently as a result. Um, but outside of that, it, it's mostly Australian. Yeah, I think because the, the most of my clients reach and even that the reach of my social media is within Australia more so than abroad. Um, I, I would have to probably achieve some level of pro success, I would imagine, in order to tap into the international market. And uh, that's what we're working on at the moment. And, um, mate, because we're talking about sort of online, how do you think, what do you think the um, the effect of social media has had on bodybuilding as a whole? Not just because, I guess, uh, you know, back in the day when we were sort of uh, a bit younger, we might have been hanging around online forums or even waiting for a magazine to come out and find out results of a show, whereas now you can watch them live, they're live streamed. But also on top of that, the the social media following that the individual competitors have, like how do you think all of this combined has changed the landscape? It, it, it seems on the surface that bodybuilding is a lot bigger than what it used to be and the number of categories that you can compete in would certainly suggest that. But do you think that is the main factor is that, social media, live streaming of shows, things like that. It's just made it so much more available for people. It's in it's in your face, really, um, that it's it's just seen this crazy growth now in bodybuilding. It seems like it's in a, a bit of a golden era to some degree, at least in the amateur ranks, it seems like it is. It seems like the amateur ranks are, are, are growing across the world. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it does just increase its exposure. And um, as a result, people – can sort of see that it is perhaps accessible to them um, and achievable to them, certainly with the different divisions that are in play these days. I think it's fantastic for the athletes because they can build a personal brand and they can potentially generate income and, and businesses within the fitness industry as a result, whereas in the past it would, would have been very, very difficult to do that. Um, I think it, 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 that's all upside, like you can sort of enhance your uh, career and, and profitability but the downside obviously of the social media is that people get picked apart to the nth degree like if you go back to the glory days um the magazines would portray the athletes as absolute superstars when in, mm -hmm. in, in reality you know their lives were potentially a mess and all that sort of stuff <laughs> like and, and and even as far as the athletes are concerned they would they would only uh you know have pictures published of them in their best poses, from the best yeah. angles. And when they're looking their best, they, they're they not going to, if they're out of condition from the back, well, we won't post a back picture of that person, you know? like So it, it was always, they created the illusion that everyone was in incredible condition year round. Everyone was, you know, driving sports cars and had hot women hanging off them. And, uh, and they and they were, you know, always portrayed at their absolute best. Whereas social media can, can show you at your best, but it, it, it uh, you know, it allows the chinks in the armor to come through as well. Um, and that could lead to backlash and hatred and and, and things like that. So it's it's interesting. I, I like to be honest with you, the pressure of social media uh, for an upcoming competitor is something they have to navigate. Where we didn't really have too much of that, and I and our bodybuilders prior to that didn't either. You would only find out who your competitors were when you rocked up on the day. Um, but nowadays, everyone knows who they're competing against, and everyone's posting their updates and things like that. And I do feel like there is a great deal more pressure to perform as a result. Um, so it's a it's a bit of a double-edged sword. It's definitely helping promote the industry, but it can both make the athlete's life easier and harder at the same time. And just on that point, like if maybe you didn't have your best showing or something like didn't quite go according to plan back in the day and you're on the forums, you know, you might have at worst five to ten comments that are negative about you. And that was the end of the world. That was pretty hard to take. But now in comparison, you know, you could – put yourself open to thousands of comments depending on your following in social media so it certainly has changed that landscape but how do you see i guess the wider um impact of technology on people's knowledge of bodybuilding when it comes to everything from nutrition training i mean again previously we were waiting for bodybuilding magazines to come out and tell us to take cell tech and muscle tech and, you know, arginine and ornithine and all those amino acids that we thought we had to take. Whereas nowadays, I mean, you can look up YouTube and you can sit through lectures and you can follow people on social media. Like 
would you say the level of knowledge out there has become so much more available? Do you feel that it's lifted the standard of bodybuilding at just even the amateur level? Like if you, you look at the nationals, it, it seems like it has come up, you know, a number of levels over the years. Undoubtedly. Like that, there, there is just a, an immense amount of free information out there these days. Uh, I mean, granted, you have to sift through some fairly dodgy information sometimes to find it, but if you've got your good sources, then you can – you can educate yourself without a degree. Like you, you can be absolutely brilliant in the field of bodybuilding. And I find I'm constantly having to upskill and learn new things and follow smarter people than myself and um, continue to level up because there is a new generation of bodybuilders and bodybuilder coaches coming up that have a fantastic understanding of physiology and, and you know, the application of, you know, uh, chemicals. Like It's just, it's unlimited. Um, and I've said this in the past to others that you can focus on one thing your entire life and continue learning. Like if you just wanted to focus on programming, you could devote your entire life to programming um, and you would continue to learn and learn and learn. Uh, but you could do the same with nutrition. You could do the same with endocrinology and drugs and you know all that sort of stuff. Uh, and there are specialists in those fields and someone like myself can't really be a specialist. I literally do not have the hours and the day to be the greatest programmer in the world, the greatest nutritionist in the world, the greatest at pharmacology in the world. Um, so I just have to steal the relevant information from the experts in their fields and then apply it to the, the best of my ability to my client base. Um, but undoubtedly the level has gone up and up and up. I, I was, you know, I was at the nationals this past weekend and there were people in the second call outs in some of these divisions, which would have been threatening for overall wins just two or three years ago. It's um, unbelievable um, how far the, and fast the sport is progressing. Um, so, yeah, if we as coaches continue to need to get better and better and better as well so that we can continue to elevate the athletes. Well, I guess it's it's like someone might engage your services then to, to sift through all that information because there is so much information available. Like what do I follow? You could you could find one answer for one thing and then find the complete opposite answer for the same thing. Then it can be very, very difficult. So I guess a, a good coach will help you to find the relevant information that's going to give you the best result. But do you think in some regard that opens up the door for a lot of um, substandard coaching, sort of fraudsters in a way that it's a lot of copy and paste and like it's 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 still a bit still a bit unregulated and dodgy the old fitness industry when it comes to coaching, isn't it? Like it's it's a bit underground still even to this day, especially bodybuilding. Especially bodybuilding, you know, there's a lot of hearsay. I, I do this, do that, but they don't necessarily know what they're talking about. So I guess it comes down to having trust in the coach and believing that coach is going to give you the best information and it's going to have the best outcome for you. Yeah, look, you can you can portray yourself as having lots of knowledge by just uh, plagiarizing other people's work, but the actual application of the knowledge at the right time for the right individual, factoring in personal circumstances and lifestyle and all that sort of stuff, um, I think that you know the cream will ultimately rise to the top and the best coaches will continue to get the best consistent results because they have the ability to factor in uh, you know, lots of different variables, uh, let's say. So the, it's one thing to be able to regurgitate information. It's another thing to be able to apply it. And it's also uh, another thing to understand how to do things when it's not all going right. Like a lot of, uh, you know, coaches these days, it's like, this is the optimal way to do it. Cool. But what if your client can't do it that way because of work stress or life stress or just time constraints or whatever it is? What's the next best thing they can do? And, and how does that all blend together? And how does that flow onto the other aspects of their program, whether it be nutrition or appetite or whatever it is that you're playing around with? So um, you can, uh, I think through deceptive means, you can portray yourself as being a good coach, but your results will ultimately determine whether you're a good coach because you have to apply them to human beings and human beings as a general rule are imperfect. Um, so yeah. the optimal doesn't always work out. Yeah, yeah. And, and so then uh, let's do an example. Let's say you get someone that comes in the door, they want to go on their first bodybuilding show, uh, maybe say 18 months, so they need a bit of work. I want to go on my first bodybuilding show, 18 months. Then you get a female walking through the door, wants to compete in her first uh, bikini show in 18 months. What's different? Is it the same? Is it essentially the, the, the same overall uh, considerations or you know, is it really different? Are the, uh, is someone going in a bikini comp going to train very differently and have a very different nutritional plan or overall sort of uh, plan for the next 18 months? Are they similar? What's the differences between, say, a bodybuilder and someone who's going in a bikini contest 
considering they both want to get on stage, uh, showing off plenty of lean muscle, presentation, body fat reduction. How, how does it differ? And how did you work uh, that so out, mate? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. On, on a foundational level, it's exactly the same. You know, like like you, you build muscle. How do you build muscle? You know, like oh, let's progressively overload in the gym. Let's eat the surplus, have adequate protein, rest and recover. Doesn't matter if you're a bikini athlete or a bodybuilder. That's that's going to be your means of building muscle. And if you want to drop body fat, let's create a calorie deficit and you know train with enough intensity to retain the muscle and you know do all that sort of stuff. So, it, on a foundational level, it's very much the same. But the ultimate physique they have to sculpt is quite different. So the way that the programming will definitely be different for a bikini athlete than a bodybuilder. Like it, there's, and, and you can sort of break, break the rules, I guess, to a degree, uh, depending on an individual circumstances. Like if you were to give a bodybuilder, you know, 18 sets of glutes a week, uh, you would be wasting your time and wasting their resources. They, they do not need uh, these gigantic glutes. They need a, a balanced physique, you know, they, and you can only handle so much cumulative stress and cumulative work. Um, but a bikini girl can happily neglect her chest and neglect her arms and um, perhaps even to a degree neglect other body parts depending on their sort of natural genetic uh, strengths and weaknesses. And they can do, and they can prioritize different body parts. So the distribution of stress between a bikini girl and a bodybuilder will be very, very different uh, when it comes to the programming. But the ultimate principles still remain the exact same. Like I, I want to make that bikini girl as strong as I possibly can in the movements which will ultimately lead to the hypertrophy in the areas that I want to grow. Um, so in a way, it's different, and in a way, it's exactly the same. Um, so when it comes to a, a, fat loss, it's the same. So for for a, a male bodybuilder, we're, we're essentially training, you know, all body parts, plenty of volume. We want to bring everything up very evenly. Uh, for for a, a female looking in, in bikini, we're going to specifically target muscle groups, um, maybe well above what you would normally consider for your average individual so it really comes down to that final look on stage. Like you said, there might be a lot of chest training. Arm training could be a very heavy what glute focus, hamstring, quad focus. I'm assuming some back. So it, like you said, you're going to tailor it to the individual. But just as, as a bit of a breakdown, you're definitely training muscle groups a lot less than what you would for a traditional bodybuilding show. Because some, some people groups. might not understand that. Yeah, yeah, some muscle groups, absolutely. Like, yeah, as a general rule of thumb, my bikini athletes do three sets of chest a week, uh, and they do so just to maintain the integrity of the shoulder joint, like just a, a distribution of force across the shoulder to prevent injuries. But it, it's not for cosmetic purposes whatsoever. Uh, it's the same with arms. I've got some bikini clients that just do, don't train arms at all if they've got naturally muscular arms. Otherwise, they might do, you know, three sets of triceps, three sets of biceps. But they might do, you know, 18... 21 24 sets of glutes um like it, it, especially if they've got super dominant quads or hamstrings and we're trying to balance that out by bringing the glutes up um they do a lot of delt work as well um and, and a little bit of back like and again the back is more just a, a, as a, a partly from an aesthetic component but it's also again to maintain the integrity of the shoulder joint if you're doing lots of you know a vertical push you need to do a little bit of vertical pull and all that sort of stuff but um yeah the 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 way you're managing the load per muscle group um, is very, very different. Um, but potentially the overall load, like the, the overall working sets might be similar to a bodybuilder. It's just that they're distributed onto body parts in a disproportionate manner, comparatively speaking. Yep. And um, what about when it comes to nutritional considerations and the differences between, let's say, the same example that we gave before, and, and we're assuming, I guess, it's an extended off-season – I guess when it comes to your, your male bodybuilders, you're looking to push the calories in. I mean, you don't want to just put on body fat, of course, but you're looking to push the calories in, push the protein in, um, you know, build that surplus. What about for a, a off-season bikini competitor that might first come to you? How do you sort of judge what targets that you want to sit them on? And I know part of it would be related to their composition, but um, is it similar to a bodybuilding style diet? Relatively, yeah. Like are we, we're still going for the same sort of protein targets per kilo of body weight. We're still aiming to get them in a calorie surplus. Obviously, their body mass isn't going to be as great as that of a bodybuilder, so we're going to have to take that into consideration. Their caloric requirements are going to be much, much lower as a result. Um, but all the other principles apply. You know, we want to address micronutrients. We want to get in essential fats. So, yeah, it's just a case of ticking off all the boxes. That one is just – it's very, very similar. It's just scaled down because they are smaller bodies in general. 
But it, yeah, again, we're still looking at surpluses. I guess you have to take into consideration the psychological aspect of time more so with bikini competitors. Uh, male bodybuilders are probably happier staying in the big, strong, fluffy phase than, than some of my female athletes are. And I'll have to pull back um, and, and perhaps implement little mini diets and, and things like that in order to uh, tidy up their composition, literally to keep them happy under some circumstances uh, because you have to be able to enjoy the process as well as, you know, or if you don't enjoy the process, you're just not going to last the test of time to get the ultimate results that you need. Uh, but outside of that, yeah, nutritional considerations are very, very similar, just just factoring in size, I guess. And uh, just on that, because you spoke about mini diets, is that something that might be like a two-week strategy, four-week strategy? Is it a, a prolonged diet to get them to get a bit leaner in the off-season and then you can add the calories back in? Or is it just literally case-by-case case up to the individual? Yeah, it is a big case-by-case, case, but my, my general philosophy is, you know, if we're talking about off-seasons, you do long periods in a small surplus and then you do shorter periods in a much more aggressive deficit. Um, and that's just to fa take into consideration like metabolic adaptations and things like that. If we only spend a short time in a significant deficit, there'll be little metabolic downregulation, but there'll be significant fat loss and then we can get back to growing. Uh, you see all sorts of issues come when people spend extended periods of time in a small deficit followed by short periods of time in an excessive surplus. Like that, That's going to lead to... Um, excessive fat gain and yet a still somewhat re re uh, suppressed metabolism and re suppressed need due to behavioral adaptations and all that sort of stuff as well. So, um, yeah, little little um, mini cuts and things like that are, are generally, for me, four and preferably no more than six weeks in an offseason. And so just to build that out, if we're talking about maybe that, that drop in your total daily energy expenditure for people out there that don't understand it as much. So we're saying that uh, you're in a surplus for a period of time you're in a calorie deficit, it's it's short and sharp, and by doing that, you prevent some of the downturn that comes from your total daily energy expenditure. Uh, when it comes to your NEAT, so your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, um, also, you know, we want to keep, you, you want to keep your training performance as high as possible. So obviously being in a surplus then uh, has an effect on your exercise activity thermogenesis. Um, and also, is it, to do with your your like your resting metabolic rate and leptin and resetting that like or, or trying to ensure that it doesn't stay too low for too long because leptin levels have a direct impact on your NEAT and your resting metabolic rate and that type of thing. So I guess it, I do a similar strategy, um, surplus for, for the majority of the time, short, sharp drop just to prevent that metabolic downturn and then you can sort of get back up to the surplus and it seems to work well. Mate, you, that's exactly it, right? There. It's it's all of that, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's also, I mean, you sort of touched on it. The the neat down regulation is partly due to you know, the, the leptin and stuff like that, but it's it's mostly just due to fatigue and, and behavioural changes of sitting in a deficit for a long period of time. Like, it's amazing how people's bodies adapt, uh, and, and it's a, just a survival mechanism. Like if you're stuck in a famine, it's unlikely that you're going to be sitting there tapping your foot and fidgeting and bouncing around in your chair. Uh, because your body's trying to conserve as much energy as possible. And if you spend a long time in a deficit, it, it starts to resemble a famine-like state. Not that I'm not saying you go into starvation mode or anything like that, but um, your, your body changes. Like, it's, it's pretty clever. It's an amazing adaptive organism. So um, we want to prevent it from adapting to that deficit so we can keep it humming along at a higher speed. And you just touched on it there. If someone has a sedentary job, um, is it part of your programming? Do you encourage them to aim for step targets? Um, if you do, are those step targets outside of their exercise activity or do you just take the, the total amount of steps for the day to simplify it? Is that a consideration for you depending on their lifestyle factors when it comes to their daily activity levels? 100%. Steps, steps are something I've been trying to instill in my clients as sort of a, a, a foundational principle um, for many years now. It's something that I've applied to my life and I feel like I benefit a great deal from it because I am essentially a, a sedentary office worker now. I sit on my computer in my office for, for very long periods of time and I do actively go out and see 10,000 steps a day um, and I feel much better for it and I maintain much better body composition for it. Uh, so for the vast majority of my clients, they do have a step target, and I like to keep it totally separate from um, 
other forms of exercise like uh, cardio. Like I don't want the cardio to contribute to the step count. I want a baseline level of low intensity activity. And then we put the high intensity activity on that. And that becomes even more critical in the latter stages of a contest prep when you're trying to manage fatigue and, and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's, it's integral. There's not a client on my database that doesn't have a step target. Yep, yep. Okay, and then we're talking about contest prep. So if we take those uh, two athletes that have come to you and they've they've sort of they're wrapping up the off season, they're about to start the contest prep. Uh, how long do you like to prep with your athletes in a contest prep for? And are you aiming for a certain body composition before that prep even begins, or does it just all start from the contest prep time frame? Yeah, great question. And like, I am trying to set people up for a great contest prep. Uh, a lot of the success of my clients, I can determine by their starting point. Um, if you're coming to me and you already have high activity, uh, relatively low calories and lots of body fat, uh, we're in trouble at the start of that prep. I, I want <laughs> and I try to position my clients to start a prep on relatively low activity, relatively good body composition and a relatively good metabolism for the you know, use of the broad general term so that we got plenty of room to move um so yeah that's what i'm looking at doing in the off season and that means you have to sort of reverse engineer back from that contest day um as a general rule of thumb i, I don't want anyone dropping well certainly uh, my female competitors i definitely do not want them dropping more than half a kilo a week for the, the majority of their prep so if they have 10 kilos to lose i want at least a 20 week prep to do it in uh, it's a little bit different with larger bodybuilders. Like if you're 100 kilos plus, you can quite comfortably drop about 1% of your body mass a week um, without suffering too many negative repercussions. So if you're 100 kilos plus, you probably can drop a kilo a week, um, certainly in the early stages of your contest prep without suffering too much. Um, but my female athletes is a general rule of thumb, you know, 60, 50 kilos thereabouts. So about half a kilo a week is appropriate for them. So yeah, I, as, a, as a general rule, like a 20-week prep, Prior to that, there's going to be at least a 10-week period where I'm trying to escalate your calories uh, and ensure that you're in a good position metabolically with relatively low output. And that often means that preceding that 10-week build into the contest prep, there's probably a little mini cut because I want to tidy up your body composition to ensure that at the end of that 10-week building phase, you've still got the, the composition that we want. So it's it, you can look at it like that. We've almost got a 36-week preparatory phase for, for the contest. Um, and prior to that, I call it the prep, really I call it the prep before the prep. Hundred percent, like yeah, and, and I, I think the the most serious athletes take every phase uh, seriously. You know, like like you, what you know, immediately post show, ah, I could just eat whatever I want. Well, not really, because you, you know we want to be able to get your metabolism up post show. Uh, and granted, from a health perspective, you need to get a little bit of body fat on relatively quickly. But then from there, you need to rein it in and ensure that the, the surplus is small and extended for a period of time to undo all the damage you did on their prep. And, and that's really, really important because if you don't do that, you just accumulate a whole lot of body fat and you've still got a somewhat suppressed metabolism. Oh, what do we do now? Do we have to do we go into a diet? Like we don't want to go into diet. Your metabolism's suppressed, so we just keep eating. Like it, it's every phase is important. Um, and I think it's important for the coach to sort of relay that to the athlete so that they understand, you know, there's times to take this extra serious. And and there are times where you can afford a little bit of leniency. You don't have to be a bodybuilding robot. Like in the off season, when you've built your metabolism back up, you're fully recovered, you can have a little bit of fun with food. It's not going to kill you whatsoever. Um, but there are times where you've got to, you know, rein it in and, and keep things tight, and perhaps when you don't want to. Um, and then there are other times where you can have a little bit more freedom. And and do you find body weight to be the best measure of progression? And, and what I mean by that is let's, or, or are you looking at visual appearance? I, I know it's a bit of both. I know it's not exclusive just to one, but let's say someone has an amazing uh, check-in period since they last checked in with you. Visually they've, they've made some dramatic changes, but on the scale weight, it hasn't, hasn't moved at all. Um, I, I'm guessing you don't necessarily consider that to be a bad outcome. So do you look for like certain visual indicators? Like I know I have some that I look for on, on people just, and it's not specific to the individual. I just know there's some areas that will show a, a lot of change in a short period of time. For me, uh, an area has always been, you know, someone's upper back from the rear shot, looking at their traps and their upper back. Like you can see them leaning down there very quickly. Like it, it's very, very apparent. Um, So how do you sort of manage that, especially working online with somebody if someone's visually changed for a good check-in period and they haven't changed their body weight at all, that's not necessarily a bad outcome. 
it's not a bad outcome at all, no. Like, I mean, ultimately, bodybuilding is a visual sport. So if you improve the visual, you've improved as a bodybuilder. Um, I mean, there, there's – you get to a point where that scale weight has to change. Like, you know, when you're relatively advanced um, and, you you know, you've, you're at sort of pre peak levels of muscle mass, you're probably not going to build any more unless the scale weight goes up. Like, it's just the reality of it. Now, if you're if you've lost some muscle tissue or something like that, uh, you can rebuild muscle while even in a deficit, just due to the magic that is muscle memory. Um, and, and in circumstances like that, it, it will be you know totally visual, and the scale weight could be almost disregarded. Um, so yeah, it depends on the setting, but ultimately, visual is number one, um, and scale weight's probably number two. But it, it scale weight's still very very important because ultimately, we're always manipulating energy balance. Uh, and if the scale weight isn't going up, you're not in a surplus, even if you think you are, or even if your TDE calculator says you are, you're not. Um, and it's likewise, if, if you're not going down on the scales, uh, barring a, a myriad of other you know factors, whether it be hormonal, digestion, whatever, if over an extended period of time, you're not going down on the scales because there are variables at play, um, you're probably not in a deficit either. So um, yeah, it's, it is a still a valuable point of data. But at the same time, it's not the be all and end all. And and how are we how are we creating this deficit? Is it cardio coming up, calories coming down, a bit of both? How do we create? How do you kick off the deficit and and then see it through also throughout the contest prep? Yeah, it's generally a calorie reduction is is the biggest thing that that will do it. I mean, if you think about creating a deficit, um, in, just purely from a mathematical perspective. If we had to drop the half a kilo of body fat a week and we need a 3,500 calorie deficit, if you were to try to do that through output alone, you would just burn yourself out. Like you would just be doing an hour of super high intensity cardio every single day, uh, to, to and really high intensity cardio in order to be able to create a deficit purely with output alone. Now that's going to have negative repercussions on performance. That's potentially going to have uh, negative repercussions when it turns to recovery, um, and potentially even a loss of muscle. So you're better off creating the bulk of the deficit initially with a calorie reduction, in my opinion, and escalating output to a degree. Uh, but there's a finite limit to people's ability to tolerate stress um, and workload. So you can only push the output so far. So it's not unusual to end up on quite low calories if you want to end up in incredible yep. uh, you know, and condition. And do you see differences, I guess, with the the like differences in physiology between males and females in that calorie deficit? Does one handle it better than the other, or is there like hormonal considerations? And and I, I mean, I know females just need a higher level of body fat, so when they get extremely lean, I mean, they're really really fighting nature. Um, so how do you like what differences do you see between your male and your female competitors who are competing and, and dieting quite aggressively? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I, I guess it's all just sort of, again, related to their body weight and body composition and even individual preferences. Like I, I meet, I meet some guys that, that are like, I would rather just starve than ever do cardio. And it's sort of like, yeah, all right, you can starve then. Um, and, and I've got uh, other clients where maybe they come from a super athletic background and they're just absolute workhorses and they're willing to just do outrageous amounts of cardio just due to their you know, athletic past or whatever, in which case I probably will push the cardio a little bit more. Um, and, and But again, it, depend, it all depends on outcomes. Um, at a certain point, uh, a certain point, everyone's on low calories and just doing high output is, <laughs> is generally how it works. But but there's there's more, I would say it's more individual variants than gender specific variants because I, I've met outliers in, in both instances. I, I had a one girl that I was coaching and she was um, – she was a qualified uh, nutritionist, like a proper nutritionist, like one that could, you know, work in hospitals, not like a sports nutritionist. And she she just had no capacity to endure work. Like she just couldn't. She would burn out and have all sorts of inflammation responses, fatigue responses, just from, you know, like if, if anything above 10,000 steps a day was a burden to her, let alone uh, introducing cardio on top of it. So we just went super, super low calories. And like, I mean, super low calories, like 800 calories a day, low calories. And and she got in great shape. And and you, we used to joke about it because we'd be like, you know, technically I'm meant to be one of the best bodybuilding coaches. She's like more qualified than me with nutrition. And she's on 800 calories a day. Like between us, we should be able to do better. But this was what her body demanded. So I think when people look at, 
you know, studies and things like that, that. And it's all based on an average and there's outliers, there's the extremes in every end. And I've had this discussion with a doctor I used to train who was an anesthesiologist and he'd said, you know, you come out of university and you think you know everything, you've got all these things that you measure and precise and it's based on this, it's based on that, you administer it. But then all of a sudden, halfway through the surgery, this person's becoming conscious again. And you're like, it, it defies the laws of what I've been taught in university but they're an outlier in their study and they've got an amazing clearance rate, a genetic mutation, whatever it is. And you'll get clients like that. And if you're not uh, up for, you know, like if you don't have an open mind, if you you can't look at things from a, a different perspective and adapt your approach, that person's going to fail. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's an individual based thing as to what you push, whether it's calorie reductions or output targets. And it's, it's based on numerous factors. And there's nothing there but experience for yourself, is there? Like you can, like you said, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but yes, over the years, you're just going to come into these cases where it they just they're outliers, they defy expectations and logic. And I guess that's where the benefit of having a good experienced coach is that the coach can adapt and and can change to the circumstances. Whereas someone who might be just regurgitating a lot of information out on the internet, they might really hit a, a brick wall there. Yeah, and I, it goes both ways. I've got I've got positive outliers as well. Where you know I've had like two of my bikini pros, Laura Young and Morgan Eldrett. There, well, they, they've got it's partly due to their personalities, but they typically their diet goes all right. Let's reduce your calories, bang, all right, and they'll get to lose weight steadily for about ten weeks. Then we'll reduce the calories again, and they're in contest shape. <laughs> and that's it. Like they, they just they do not adapt. Their their metabolisms don't seem to downregulate. Um, they be but most importantly, their behaviors don't change. Like, like they are the type of people that will be busy and doing stuff, no matter no matter what. Like that. So they just they just don't need high level coaching, which is kind of funny because they're the most high level athletes. And, and I guess people it will have asked me what's the difference between coaching pros and coaching amateurs. As a general rule, it's easier to coach pros. Like they're genetically elite, they're highly motivated, they're disciplined, they're regimented, they've got the personality that suits the lifestyle, like all this sort of stuff. So the outliers go both ways. But yeah, ultimately you are somewhat reliant on your coach and their ability to adapt it and change according to your circumstances, both in terms of your lifestyle and your physiology and everything else. And I think uh, the, yeah, it, it is only experience uh, can bring you that. And as a general rule of thumb, you learn more from your bad clients than your good clients. Like if I only coached Laura Young's and Morgan Eldratz, I would I would have zero skills. So I would just be like, that's easy. All you do is reduce their calories by 600 calories per day at the start. And then, you know, 10 weeks out, reduce by 300 calories more and they're in shape. What's wrong with you, you know? But it does not work like that for the vast majority of us. Yeah. Okay. So let's say the, the contest prep's uh, moving along. We're getting close to the end. It's, it's coming up to peak week. We're not quite there yet. Um Emotional factors, breakdowns, that they start to they start to kick in a bit, little bit. And do you find that sometimes uh, your coaching role changes from purely a technical perspective? You know, do this and do that to an emotional counselor of sorts. And was that a bit unexpected with coaching? I mean, I know f- for myself, it was something that was yeah, it's 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 been a real eye opener. Uh, have you found the same where it sort of shifts from technical to emotional support? Yeah, so this was probably my greatest weakness when I started coaching, and, and I honestly believe it's now my greatest strength. Like, um, I, I remember you telling me a story when you were a, a fiery and, you know, you're first on, on site for a you know horrific road crash or something like that, and your skill was being able to make people that were in a horrendous traumatic you know, condition right. and you could make them laugh, yes. you know? And, and, and strangely enough, uh, this has translated over to me. I can take an incredibly emotional, highly strong, agitated bikini competitor, make them laugh, calm them down, and then allow them to see things objectively. And, and I honestly believe that's probably my biggest coaching skill. And I think it's why I do appeal to the, you know, the female clientele a little bit better is that I can address emotions, diffuse emotions, and then bring them back to what needs to be done in the here and the now. And I think that really helps them calm down. So, yes, it is it is 100% something I do. I do so very, very willingly and uh, quite quite easily now. It, it, it's funny. Is that, um, sorry, Scotty, sorry to cut you off, but is that a skill that you've learned at home, being married with two <laughs> young daughters? Is that is that a home skill that's crossing over, mate? 
hundred percent is crossing over to my parenting role and my role as a husband. Absolutely, it is. So I'm not sure where it was cultivated first, uh, but it is utilised in every aspect of my life. You are hundred percent correct. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. I it, and when I started as a coach, I was terrible. I had no empathy whatsoever because I knew what I went through and I knew how I would handle it. And I was just a workhorse and I could plow through anything. You know? And I think I look back at what I did um, and I think it, I could just, there's so few of my clients that could handle what I did to get in shape. Like you remember getting in contest condition, calories only went down, but they only went down yeah. and, and yeah. output only went up. Like there was no fatigue mitigation. There was no, you know, refeeds and things like that. That's called cheating on your diet. Like you just yeah. went harder. That's all you did. Yeah. Um, so I, I look at it now and I sort of think, man, these clients have got it good. But uh, at, at the same time, the, the outcomes are so much better. And and I have over time cultivated the empathy and, and the communication skills to be able to address their emotional needs, yes. Because there's, there's like, uh, there's a lot of potential causes, isn't there? I mean, there's the low calories, there's potential hormone changes, sleep disruption, uh, energy levels, cognitive function, worrying about their physique. Are they going to be ready in time? managing the the workload that they have in place and time management like it, it's not even that it's just one thing that the athlete needs to try to manage it's it's a multitude of things that have huge wide-ranging impacts on their whole life because it's do this exercise get these steps in do this with your nutrition do this for your posing and then at the end of the day you're going to stand on stage wearing almost nothing and we're going to specifically judge you on how you look so it, it like it's not one factor is it yeah, sometimes it's best not to look at it logically when you put it like that. But um, <laughs> it, 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 it's very true. And, and look, I can, I'm, I'm almost at a point now where I can sort of sense the stage of the prep they're at and, and just know what they need in terms of support. Um, and, and, you know, I spend a lot of my time, you know, focusing on we control the controllables. We don't worry about things that are outside of our control. Um, what do we need to achieve in the short term? Let's just focus on that. Let's not worry about the future. Let's try and keep anxiety at bay and, um, and just focus on the, you know, the process as well, more so than the outcomes. Like there's lots of little things that I preach in order to try and ease the burden on the client. I, I'm also a big believer in sort of minimizing expectations. I, I feel like the, the, the coaches that are, you know, you're going to win a pro card, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you're going to do that. It puts a lot of pressure on the client where I'm more about you do your best. Like I'm going to do my best to make you look your best. You do your best with what I, I give you to do. And the outcome will take care of itself because, once again, we're not controlling the judges. We're not controlling the final competitors. And I try and build them up and encourage them to get their sense of gratification and their sense of success of their ability to execute uh, more so than the, the final placings and things like that. And I think that's really, really important uh, because it is a very, very gratifying sport um, if you can do it and, and, and do it to the best of your abilities. Um, and that doesn't necessarily factor in the final outcome whatsoever because there's not like if we're to be honest there's not a lot of competition on the actual day of the show itself like everyone's going to rock up and you're going to be judged it's not like you're playing a, a, a team sport or a ball sport where you've got to sort of out maneuver or outthink your opponents the competition is the prep itself isn't it like that's that's the competition and when you're backstage and you see someone who's in insane condition you're like fire out that dude or that chick's outworked me potentially or they put in the work so the, the competition itself is the prep. The day of the show, yes, you've got to get up on stage and you've got to do some posing and presentation. It's all important, but it's essentially it's done and dusted by the time you wake up that day, isn't it? The, the actual competition for the bodybuilding show is almost by yourself in the gym for the 16 weeks or, or even longer previous to that. 100%. And, and I see that as my role on the day as a coach is keep the athletes calm. I know like, that's literally my job. Like if, you know, you're making major moves and manipulations on show day, something's gone wrong as a general rule of thumb. So um, I'm, I am mostly on show to just keeping athletes calm. And it, and it is funny because I am trying to reduce uh, the stress, I guess, in, in the latter stages of the contest prep. And in the off season, I'm generally trying to in increase the urgency. Like, like I, I'm a big believer in, in saying the comp you're winning the competition now in the off season, because the muscle you build in the off season is the muscle you're going to take onto the stage. You're not going to build it in the contest prep phase that's the, that's the fat loss phase. So we need to put in the work now. We need to focus on performance metrics and things like that and, and, and build this muscle. So, yeah, the competition's almost year-round with the exception of competition day, which is kind of ironic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, and and so then let's say we're getting close to the comp day. It's peak week. We've hit peak week. Oh, it's just a bit of fluid. I'm just going to lose it in peak week. It's all good. It's just a bit of fluid. Is it just a bit of fluid? Is it, is it or is it just body fat? Someone's not in shape. But there's a lot of a lot of misconceptions about peak, peak week. I mean, my personal view is you, you can make some changes in peak week, and a lot of it is related to your uh, muscle glycogen stores and and even your your tan and your final presentation and that type of thing. But I know there's a lot of coaches out there um, cutting water, cutting sodium, diuretics, extreme peak week scenarios looking to you know improve someone's physique by like you know quite a large factor not just the the finishing touches so what's what's your take on peak week and how should an athlete look at hitting peak week so seven days out from the show should they be looking like they're just holding fluid or is that really they're out of shape and they've got body fat Look, if it's they could potentially be holding some fluid, but um, you should be working to eliminate the reasons why you'll be holding fluid. You know, in the lead up to the show. Um, so, yeah, look, my goal in, in a peak week, and and the longer I do this, the more simple my peak weeks become. Uh, the less variables are manipulated. Um, the goal is to reduce inflammation and stress, one of the causes of fluid retention, and to increase muscle glycogen. That's it. That's, that's the role of my peak weeks, uh, especially in my bikini athletes. I mean, if we're talking the highest of high-level bodybuilding uh, and there's a, a myriad of PEDs in, in the mix and all, all sorts of things going on, potentially water restriction, diuretic use, things like that, maybe some uh, manipulation of fluids on the day of the show, just depending on the athlete. I've got some clients which just drink all day long. Uh, because they just don't show any deterioration of their conditioning over the course of the day. I've got other athletes that over the course of the day get slowly softer, and I might restrict their fluids on the day. But at the start of the peak week, you need to have your body composition exactly where it needs to be. You you do not want to be losing body fat in your peak week. Uh, Obviously, you're not going to be building muscle. Um, The goal at that point is just a tiny bit of fine-tuning, and and the vast majority of it comes about by um, increasing glycogen stores. (laughs) So would you say there's far more to lose on peak week than there is to gain for your average individual who's in pretty good shape leading into peak week? If your peak week protocol is going for dramatic differences, a high reward will come with high risk. Um, so the vast majority of people which are trying to, you know, dramatically increase fullness and then seriously dry out and all that sort of stuff, uh, as you and I have probably experienced back in our days, more often than not, it backfires on you. Um, because your body's amazing. Like, it's always trying to re-establish homeostasis. If you try and push it in one direction, it tries to push back in the other. Um, so it, there's a lot of mechanisms within your body that, that we cannot control. Um, so you're better off being somewhat kind to it and just nudge it in a particular direction rather than just push it super hard because it will push back. Yep, yep. And then uh, final final question about these, uh, I guess, two athletes that have gone through their contest prep. The show's over. Reverse diet, that works, doesn't it? I'm going to keep calories low and just slowly bring them up week after week, and that'll work out fine for me. And within 10 weeks, I'll get back to my off-season targets and there'll be no problems. Or is it the recovery diet now that's really sort of the way to go and that's getting back up to that optimal energy availability and and getting back to some sort of level of normal physiological functioning? Yeah, look, I used to try and buy into the reverse diet concept, but 99% of people fail just because of their their bodies are craving food. Like, like, like there's all sorts of actual physiological things going on, ghrelins through the roof, leptin suppressed. They, they, there's just a, a myriad of things working against them. Um, and plus the just the social aspect of like friends and family are all like, oh, come eat, come do this, come do that. You know, like it's almost impossible for an athlete to stay on a super, super rigid diet immediately post-show. So for the vast majority of my clients these days, I tell them, post-show our goal is to put on fat like and, it, and it's sometimes confronting for them to hear that but it, literally our goal is to put on fat post-show we've been spending all this time trying to lose it but now we need to return you to a state of good health and a big part of that is having energy availability and that energy availability is largely fat deposits so um for the most of my clients now i encourage them to get about 10 percent over their contest weight and i want to get there relatively quickly like i want to get there within four or five weeks um, and at that point, normally, like hunger cues, satiety cues, all that start, stuff starts to normalize because they do actually have some energy reserves. And now we start a much slower um, process where we're actually trying to escalate that metabolism. But I like the initial gain to be pretty fast. So if I have a girl compete at 50 kilos, uh, she's in fantastic condition. Four or five weeks later, I want her at 55 kilos. 
And then I want very, very slow controlled weight gain from there. Um, so if my guy's competing at 100 kilos, it's the same sort of formula. Like getting back to 110, I'm happy to get there in five weeks and then and then go slowly from there. Yep, yep. And so uh, I guess throughout that, that whole process, off-season, contest prep, everything, over-the-counter supplements, just stuff that works. Do you, are, you a, are you a big supplement prescriber or is there like a limited sort of number of supplements that you like, some some tried and tested ones? Part of the reason my supplement store is probably closing is due to the fact that I'm not a big supplement guy. Um, no, look, the supplements I, I use for uh, convenience, like protein powder. I, I mean, I do like creatine monohydrate. Um, and, and then outside of that, it's sort of circumstantial. Like the, the, the deeper people get into contest prep, I think the more important supplements become, especially from a micronutrient perspective. Like it, it's in the off season, you can preach great diversity of food and all this sort of stuff. And you just the sheer volume of food. It's probably unlikely you're going to get, uh, you know, deficiencies and things, but in the latter stages of prep, it's quite possible you're going to need to take some additional magnesium, maybe some good fats, throw in a little bit of zinc, mate. Maybe you just go with a green superfood formula or um, a multivitamin or something like that. So, yeah, in the latter stages of prep, I do think uh, supplements certainly have their place. But for the majority of my athletes in the off-season, they're not taking much at all. Yep, yep. Are you are you a fan of, like, um, like caffeine for energy or appetite regulation? Or it's up to the individual. It's not saying you recommend or... Yeah, it's it's not something I generally recommend, um, but I'm certainly not against it either. So the the vast majority of people have some sort of stimulant in their body, and sometimes they will dramatically increase their stimulant load in, in the lead up to a competition, and they'll have to scale it back. It's probably it's probably more likely a scenario that they'll have to reduce their stimulant load than increase it um, if left to their own devices. Because you know, I am, I mean, and I've been guilty of it in the past as well, of just trying to stim stim my way through fatigue. Um, it doesn't generally pay off. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still there, don't I? And uh, mate, we've saved it. We've saved it to the end. I think everyone's been waiting for it. But uh, so you know, IFBB, we know there is muscle on top of muscle for males. There's no surprises there. But female IFBB, if you, um, I mean, number one, there's quite a few divisions in the female IFBB categories now. But if someone wants to, you know, push it for a national title, maybe a pro card. You know, are there PEDs involved for female competitors? And and mate, you can you can say what you want here. It's fine. It's not a problem if you want to leave it. Yeah, uh, I would say it, it depends. It sort of goes up per division. You know, so on the bikini division, there's the least amount. The wellness division is next up, then figure, and then women's physique. It's kind of mandatory. Um, so in, in terms of you know how many athletes utilize it. I mean, it's. I mean, it's hard to say. And again, we're sort of depending on their level. Like, if you're if you're in the first timers division of the IFBB, um, it's unlikely that fifty percent of the girls are on stuff. I would think, and maybe they are, but I, I would say less than fifty percent of my traditional first timers are, are using PEDs. But if we're talking about the open division and contending for pro cards and things like that, I would say it's it's well in excess of fifty percent. To be honest with you, uh, in, even within the bikini division, um, but it's not necessarily determining. Uh, indicator of success because uh, again, like Laura Young, 100% natural, turned pro very, very quickly and easily, um, and has moved on to you know to the pro ranks and transitioned quite well. Um, so you don't, I wouldn't say it's a necessity uh, within the bikini division, but it speeds the process up. And for the vast majority of people, do I want to get there slow or do I want to get there fast? Uh, it's pretty tempting to get there fast, and I and I kind of feel like. As a male bodybuilder who took uh, as many steroids as he get his hands on back in the day, I would be somewhat hypocritical of me to judge them for that. Um, and, and I think if utilized safely, um, and if you know the correct compounds are sourced and blood work is done and side effects are monitored, and uh, you know that you're using yeah the correct dosages, compounds, and the duration of exposure is all controlled, uh, you can do so in a very safe manner. Because I would like to think you couldn't pick which one of my girls use and which one of them don't. Um, because there's no real visual signs other than perhaps progression rates, maybe. But again, it's so individual. Like Laura Young can progress as fast or faster than the majority of my enhanced clients just because she's genetically superior and an absolute workhorse. So, uh, and I, I've got other, I don't, I don't, I'm reluctant to name them because then you can sort of start to isolate down and realize which ones are yeah. enhanced and whatever else. But I, but Laura's sort of been very vocal about her natural status. And I've got other very high level competitors that have won like national open classes, which are also natural and things like that. So it is not a necessity, 
but it is common and it is common because you get to your end goal faster. And I really feel if done properly, it's relatively safe. And again, I've had many bikini clients go on and have start families and things like that, whether they're enhanced or not. Um, I've even had, you know, figure clients, even a one uh, women's physique client um, successfully start a family. So I, I think, yeah, I think if it's done well, the the long term repercussions uh, can be minimised. Yeah, and and one final question on that: Do you feel that because you know the level of muscle mass for say something like bikini, it's not it's not massive. I mean, it's it's significant and it's substantial. But is it like if if someone you know wants to maybe step up and they're like, oh, look, I want to do this for however many years. I don't mind. I want to do it naturally. Are they living in a pipe dream, or it, it, it is possible? It's just going to take it's going to take a longer period. I mean, we're not talking about being a pro bodybuilder here, where you need you know an extra thirty kilos of lean tissue. Um, is it is it something that's attainable if if the individual was to choose to do it naturally, like you said, but within a, a longer duration? Yes, yes, it is. Like, 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 yeah, you can you can build that muscle. Well, the majority the majority of girls can. Now, is pro status attainable for the majority of girls? No. But that, that's factors outside of muscle mass. And there, there's like structural things, uh, body fat distribution. I, I think the bikini division is the most genetic division of all because you have to be structurally blessed because you can't hide structural flaws with gobs of muscle like a bodybuilder can. So for for the majority of girls, pro status is unattainable, full stop, because they don't have the genetic gifts that you need in order to be a good pro or pro, turn pro within Australia. The Australian scene is very, very strong. Um, but could you acquire the muscle mass without PEDs? I would say the majority of female athletes could do it, uh, but you're absolutely right. It just takes a, it takes a bit longer. Yeah, nice, nice. Well, mate, oh, look, it's been a, a great discussion. I have missed uh, doing our podcast and love to have you back on, but thanks for your time today, Scott. I do appreciate it. Mate, we covered heaps. It's absolute gold. I, I appreciate you taking time out of your day. So, uh, mate, thank you very much and love to have you back on board. 